All right, James chapter 4. If you'll turn there with me, this is part two of a journey we began at the end of last semester with me, and the purpose of this passage is meant to help you understand what is central to avoiding invalidating your testimony and the message you teach, you profess, you proclaim. You can say it and not live it. And if you say it and you don't live it, there's no credibility with it. Alistair Begg said, the power of God is the gospel. I'm not ashamed of it. It does have supernatural, transformational, divine power. But that power can be muted. And obviously, God can use His Word no matter who the proclaimer is or isn't. But that power can be diminished if the instrument proclaiming that message is compromised. The book you're in, the book of James, five chapters, is the oldest book by uh, origin in the New Testament. It was written by the pastor of the church of Jerusalem, James, the half-brother of Jesus Christ, the head of the church, the spokesman for the early church. He was called James the Just because of his integrity. He was called Old Camel Knees because his knees were calloused from his constant petition on behalf of the will of God and the people of God. James is writing to a dispersed community, Christians, Hebrews, Jews that were converted in Jerusalem, now dispersed like seed all over the Roman Empire. Apparently, he has heard reports that their lifestyle was inconsistent with their message. This book summarized is the behavior and validation of real Christianity. You can say you have faith, but the faith that saves is the faith that works. You don't get saved because you work. Salvation is a gift by grace through faith. But every transformed by grace through faith person validates that reality by the work that they do, the life that they live. James, in my view, summarized is the lifestyle and convictions of a biblical Christian. This is how Christianity works in real times, how it deals with difficulty, how it deals with the tongue, how it deals with the Word of God. The Word of God is the revelation of reality, and the people of God don't just hear it, study it, learn it, but they live it. Otherwise, the faith without works that you profess is useless, James says in chapter 2. Faith that's real, genuine, always works. And this is how it works. In James chapter 4, he introduces how it doesn't work, what it doesn't look like, and gives a profound solution that I'm going to argue, and I know this is the text that I have chosen, but I want to suggest to you that if you're going to be an exile a stranger and sojourner with influence and impact, you must own and master this passage. This is a divine diagnosis of what's wrong with me or what challenges me when I'm not living as a Christian ought to live. And I want to summarize the beginning with two questions. Ask yourself, what will most undermine my faith and my influence? What will most undermine my faith and my influence? And what injures everyone around you and the good and great God above you? So, we've got two questions. Because you have a divine diagnosis in this text about what will undermine Christian influence, what is incompatible, incompatible and uh, antithetical to real Christianity. And in this passage, there's a recognition that when you're inconsistent, when we are inconsistent with the claim and the life, there is a lifestyle that injures everyone around you. It creates conflict, sizable, injurious, hurtful conflict. 
And secondly, it injures and hurts the good and great God above you. It injures everyone around you, and it impacts the good and great God above you. That's the subject of this text. I want to read as a review the first five verses, and then we're going to jump into verses 6 through 10. I've given this message a title called Greater Grace. Overcoming self-centeredness and worldliness. Greater grace, overcoming self-centeredness and worldliness, the subject of this passage. This is dealing with self-idolatry and the betrayal of God and your covenant relationship with Him. This is what needs to be done in order to have victory in those critical ways. Verse 1, chapter 4, divine diagnosis. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Quarrels, verbal altercations, conflicts, even physical altercations, the rifts and the divide among you. Is it not, is not the source, that's the origin, your pleasures, comes from the word hedonism, the, the pleasures in you that wage war in your members, the members of your body or the members of your community. It's an inward war that displays itself in outward relationships. Is it not the pleasure that drives your passions? Verse 2, you lust, strong desire, and you do not have. So you commit murder. So by hyperbole, he says you're willing to do whatever it takes, including to take a life in an order to acquire what you believe you need for self-satisfaction. You're envious and cannot obtain. They have it, you don't have it, but you want it. So you fight and you quarrel. You do what you do to get what you believe you need. Verse 2 at the end. You have a method problem. You do not have because you do not ask. And you have a motive problem. You ask and you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. What is a wrong motive for a real Christian? That you may spend it on your own pleasures. Self-centered selfishness. My desires, my passions, the pleasures innate in my humanity, my inward appetite is a motivator that can be used to distort and damage my relationships with those around me and my relationship with God because verse 4 says we have to have an ally to self-satisfy. We need the world. Verse 4, you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Friendship, affection, that's what the Greek word means. You have affection because you have common interests, common values. There's something that you share with the world, a value system that allows the world to be your friend. To get what you can't get and you believe you need, you seek satisfaction from the world, the system that Satan, the God of this world, governs, but man creates in order to satisfy himself without God. The system of the world around you is an anti-God system. And it is driven by a desire, passions, pleasures within us where we seek satisfaction without God. Which God says for those who claim Christ, that's adulterous. That is the betrayal of a trust. Damaging and destructive desires, the engine in your heart through the fall of Adam is now damaging and injuring whoever in order to acquire. And it is aligning with the world that is governed antithetically to God, opposed to God, which is why it's hostility toward God. 
Verse 4, you adulterers, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? So not just conflict horizontal with each other, waging war in my members internal, those around me, but now with God. I'm hostile towards Him. Verse 4, therefore, let me conclude this way, James, James says, whoever wishes, which is an intentional word, It's an intentional pursuit. Whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Verse 5, or do you think that the Scripture speaks to no purpose? Now, this is a general summation. There is no specific verse of revelation that says this, no specific quotation. James is gathering up a a general consideration, a summation of the teaching of the Bible that says and recognizes and reveals something about God that makes this so troublesome to God. Why does God feel this way? Why does he feel like it's adultery when we, as proclaimers of Christ, seek satisfaction in an illegitimate way with the enemy of Christ? Because verse 5 says, or do you think the Scripture speaks to no purpose? He, capital H, reference to God, jealously desires the Spirit, capital S, the Holy Spirit, which he has made to dwell in us. And if you understand this verse that way, it's God loving God and God the Holy Spirit in us is affected by the relationship that we have with the world around us. We grieve the Spirit of God. The intimacy that we can enjoy through the Spirit of God, we forfeit. And God longs for intimacy with those for whom he has gifted his spirit as the agent, the personal agent, God himself, facilitating intimacy between God and man. The ESV, which some of you, and that's how the LSB, the NASB translates this verse. This verse is hard. There's debate about this verse. Taken that way, it tells you why God feels the way he does. He longs for the spirit, his spirit he's placed within you. The ESV, the uh, translation, the English Standard Version, makes the spirit little s. God, instead of saying God yearns jealously over not his spirit, but little s, your spirit that he has made to dwell in you. So the translators of the ESV Make the spirit little less, your human spirit that God has put in you. He longs for a relationship with you, your human spirit with his divine spirit. That's why he feels the way he feels. The other way to take this verse, which a number of translations translate a different way, King James, New King James, Amplified Bible, the Christian Standard Bible, the American Standard Bible, the English Revised Version, would translate this verse not as an explanation as to why God feels this way, but rather as an explanation to explain why I am this way. Why would it be that I'm so compelled for self-satisfaction, self-centeredness, that I would be worldly and the enemy of God and hostile toward God? Why would I make an alliance with the proclaimed enemy of God, the God of this world and the cosmos he governs? Why would I do that? Translation, verse 5, another option legitimately is the human spirit, that the spirit which he, God, has made to dwell in us, lusts with envy. The reason I do what I do, an alternative explanation for verse 5, is the recognition that the spirit in me, which God has placed in me, lusts with envy. And we would call that depravity. I like that translation simply because the word envy is always a negative word. 
It means to have a desire that is corrupted, a strong feeling that sours. It comes from a primitive root which means to decay. It is hard to imagine God envying jealously. So what could envy jealously? I could. My humanity impacted by the fall of Adam, my depravity is damaged with the desire to self-satisfy and envy in a way that's toxic and destructive. Literally, the verse begins with envy, as if that's the emphatic emphasis. Envy is a problem, and the reason you have a problem is the spirit in you, which God has put in you, has been damaged by the fall. Now, both interpretations don't damage the verse or the section. One explains why God feels the way he does. The other explains why I do what I do. God wants a relationship with me. Nobody can deny that. My partnership and companionship with the world injures the potential of that relationship. It's a betrayal of trust, adultery, with an illegitimate partner, the world. And it's also true that infecting me and influencing me is a spring-loaded default position which desires to satisfy myself. This envious action of the heart, this damaged engine of my soul, that's why I do what I do. I'm responsible for it, the sin that is in me, but it deeply affects my relationships around me and my relationship with God above me and the Spirit of God within me. What am I going to do? That's, and what hope do I have? If you sincerely want to follow Christ, you recognize the temptation of worldliness. You also recognize the everyday challenge of self-centeredness. Self-centeredness and worldliness are destructive this way and that way. What can I do to overcome that? Because when I'm self-centered and when I'm worldly, I undermine the gospel I pro proclaim. It's a contradiction to the faith I profess, which leads us to verse 6. And a wonderful word, but. The adversative conjunction on the other hand, he, God, gives greater grace. Greater grace is help from heaven. Grace is unmerited favor. We're saved by grace and we are helped by grace. Justification is the work of God which is a gift we receive by faith. Now listen to me. Sanctification is a gift we receive by grace through faith. Sanctification, becoming like Christ, is the work of God as an act of grace as we display faith to follow Him and live for Him. God changes people. He who began a good work will continue to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. You can go to school here, you can hear chapel messages here, and you can conclude here, I've got to try harder. That's the difference between Christ-likeness and a life that contradicts Christ. The truth is, I need to receive by faith grace and rely on Christ to make me who I am. It is His work which begins. It is his work that I cooperate with. It's not the work that I do. It's not Harry trying harder. It's Harry cooperating with the God who can do in me what I can't do in me. The changes that occur in you are the result of divine grace. As you have received him, Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, walk in him. How did you receive him? By faith. Because of his grace, you become a Christian. You're changed from the inside out. How do you become like him? 
by faith because of his grace at work in you. And so when James says God gives greater grace, he's talking about the help of heaven that will overcome your self-centeredness, your selfishness, and your worldliness. What's damaging you and ruining your testimony and your relationships, you have hope for. God gives greater grace. And let me tell you something. If you're a Christian, you need to write that on the tablet of your heart. God has more than I need. It's not just sufficient grace. It's not just amazing grace. It's greater grace. It's greater than my depravity. It's greater than the attraction of the world and its allure. It's greater than the conflicts I have and the things that I'm tempted to do and sometimes do, injurious or hurtful and hateful toward others. God has grace to change me into the man or woman, young man or woman, that will honor him as a Christian should. Glory to God, impact and influence to others and for others that live in the world in which I function. God gives greater grace. Well, how do I acquire that grace? Verse 6, therefore, do you see that word? Because that's true, you need to understand the rest of verse 6. Therefore, it says, this is the Scripture, this is prescribed, God is opposed to the proud. He's in opposition. He stands against. He's not supportive of. He's opposed to the proud. The proud are those who have an over high opinion of themselves. Those who think they can self-satisfy. Those who think they can correct their behavior. Those who think they can make it on their own or dependent upon themselves. That's an over high opinion of yourself. God is opposed to the person who is determined to work it out for their own satisfaction and benefit. To fix it or to taste it or to have it. He's opposed to that person. He is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace. What kind of grace? Greater grace, help from heaven to whom? The humble. Who are the humble? Those who admit the challenge I have is unacceptable. The condition of my life and relationships, horizontal and vertical, is not consistent with my profession. I admit that. And I also admit I can't fix that without help from heaven. I admit it, and I'm desperately dependent upon God for it. Who gets greater grace? The person who wakes up and lives life aware, I desperately need help from heaven, grace. I get up in the morning, and Will talked about praying, housed in the praying that you do ought to include God, help me. God, help me. Help me to overcome the self-centeredness that I'm prone to. Help me to avoid injuring people to acquire what I believe I have to have. The pleasures that choke the life of God. The pleasures that enslave me. The pleasures that corrupt me because of the fall of Adam. Keep me from those things. The lust of the flesh. The lust of the eyes. The pride of life. The world. Prestige. Position. Satisfaction. God, help me today the humble. That's why every day needs to begin and end, if it's possible, on your knees declaring your dependence on God who can help you and wants to help you. Verse 7, there's another therefore, and this is the section that we're going to begin today. I thought I would aim at a miracle and teach you all six of these today. My reluctance to do that is simply because if you just hear it and you don't get it, I'm convinced you won't do it or benefit from it. This is the most profound, relevant passage I know as practices and priorities to pursue in order to experience God in intimacy and healthy relationship with those around you. This is what you do as a demonstration of non-negotiable humility. Who gets greater grace? The humble do. What do the humble look like? Verses 6 through 10. 
And I know that's true because of the conjunction, submit therefore. Because it's true the humble get greater grace, and because it's true that only the humble get greater grace, you need to do these things. There are 10 verbs, 6 through 10. 10 action words. There are six categories, six things you do and and prioritize in order to experience as a consequence of displayed humility, the grace of God that will help you overcome self-centeredness and worldliness. That's what this section is. A couple of things, all of these verbs are imperatives which means non-negotiable, you need to do this, not optional. They're ingressive heiress, which means do it now. The emphasis of an ingressive heiress verb is urgency. I'll give you an example. Peter in, in Matthew 14, he's walking on water, he sees the winds and the waves, and he begins to sink, took his eyes off Jesus. And when he took his eyes off Jesus and began to sink, he used an aggressive aorist verb, save me. Not save me if you get around to it, not save me in some future moment or day or hour, save me now. So as you read these verbs, think now. Humility displays itself in immediate action. We live in a culture that procrastinates. You hear sermons, and you learn Bible lessons, and you you take notes. You read your Bible devotionally, and you uncover truth prescriptively. Christianity is not to be a delayed application reality. It's a do it now, and make sure you do it. What are the things that you do that demonstrate the humility that attracts greater grace? Number one, verse seven, there's six things we're going to aim at. We're going to begin today in the time that we have, which is not long, with number one, submitting. Key word is submission. Submitting, therefore, to whom? God. The first expression, the first priority to pursue is submission to God. Hupo tasso. Tasso is to arrange hupo under. It's you joyfully, freely arranging your will underneath His will. Self uh, lexicon, self-subordination, hupo tasso, that leads to obedience. This is the idea of saying, I know God, you have authority, and I will, by choice and humility, will subordinate my will, my wishes, my way to your prescriptive wishes and way. I'll submit to the Word of God, which is your prescriptive will, and I'll submit to the promptings of the Spirit of God who dwells within me. This is sir, yes, sir. This is not a debate. This is not a negotiation. This is not delay. This is not denial. This is yes, I will. Submitting to God is submitting and surrendering your will to God, your will under authority to the one who has authority. You feel this and see this as a picture in Genesis 41:40, when Joseph, because of the interpretation of the dream, Pharaoh says, because you have told me this, I will grant you authority. And listen to what he says. You shall be over my house, that's authority, the house of Pharaoh, and according to your command, all people shall do homage. The word literally means kiss. They would get down, kiss the ring, kiss the feet, basically say, I surrender, I submit, I follow, you're in charge. You feel that flavor in a couple of other passages that give color commentary to this idea of submission. This is 1 Kings chapter 20. This is Ahab to the conquering kings. He says 
in response to one of the kings, Ben-Hadad. This is 1 Kings 22. So Ben-Hadad, a conquering king of Israel, says this to Ahab, your silver and your gold are mine. Your most beautiful wives and children are also mine. I have absolute authority over everything you have. Let me tell you what submission looks like, what Ahab did. He said, I am yours and all that I have. The idea essential has to do with the bowing of your knee and the bowing of your will. I will do what you're asking me to do. It is for Harry, as a human being, arrogant to say to God, I'll do it when I want to, how I want to, and if I want to. Greater grace is the gift God gives to the humble who say, I will follow. You lead, I will follow in order to be what you want me to be, to experience the power that overcomes self-centeredness and worldliness, in order to maximize my life for your glory, I need to surrender my life. There's a man that many of us don't know much about. We know about the Salvation Army because of the folks who collect during the holidays with the kettles and seek donations. But the founder of the Salvation Army in Europe in England, in London, was General Booth. And General Booth was 80 years of age when the question was asked of him by an American evangelist by the name of J. Wilbur Chapman. He said to General Booth, who had probably the most profound impact upon poverty and the needs in London at that time through what was called the Salvation Army. Not a salvation group, but an army of Christians who gathered to serve the needs of those in poverty in London. And it was profound. It had massive effects in the culture. Be like somebody standing up in our culture with the challenge of homelessness and somebody standing up and saying, I'm going to address homelessness. And I'm going to attract Christians as an army of influencers to address the poverty of homelessness and profoundly transforms, whether it's Los Angeles or any other metro community, because of the efforts of Christians aligned together to deal with this social issue. And it was profound. And Booth was asked, why is it that the impact of your life and the Salvation Army has been so profoundly impactful in London among those who need help the most. So he asked that question. He asked Booth to disclose his secret. And I'm going to read what the biographer says. He hesitated a second. And then Chapman, the interviewer, said, I saw tears come into his eyes and gently flow down his cheeks. And then he said, I will tell you the secret. The secret of God using me is God has had all there was of me. There have been men with greater brains than I, men with greater opportunities, but from the day I got the poor of London on my heart and a vision of what Jesus Christ could do with the poor of London, I made up my mind that God would have all of William Booth there was. And if there is anything of power in the Salvation Army today, It is because God has had all the adoration of my heart, all the power of my will, and all the influence of my life, end quote. Dr. Chapman said as he went away from that meeting with General Booth, he said, I now know that the greatness of a man's power is the measure of his surrender. Submission to God. George Mueller would say the same thing founder of orphanages, profound effect on children without homes. He was asked what made his life so impactful on behalf of others for the glory of God, the down and out, the least. 
he said this, there was a day when I died, utterly died. I died to George Mueller, his opinions, his preferences, his taste. I died to his will. I died to the world. I died to its approval. I died to the approval of blame, even of my brethren and friends. And since I have studied only to show myself approved to God, doing the will of God. So here you are on the threshold of a new year. I said it in the Truth and Life Conference. This can be the greatest year you ever have. But it will only be a great year and profoundly transformational in you and affecting the lives around you is if there is a humility and a recognition, I need greater grace. And there is no available help from heaven, the horsepower of heaven that can move mountains and transform things. There's no potential for that until I bow my knees and I bend my will. Therefore, submit to God. So the question to begin the semester is, as you take inventory, what is needed for this year to be what I want it to be and what God wants it to be? What are the areas of my life, the categories of behavior, attitude, and action that he has prescribed that I have yet to surrender to. Because surrendering is a holistic, comprehensive submission. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done in my life even as it's done in heaven. That's a general confession. This is an action that takes that general confession and moves it into specific action. I need help. I need heaven's help. I'm going to submit my will to his will. Number two, six things, we'll handle two of those things today. Submit therefore to God, ingressive aorist, resist, do it now, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist the devil. Friendship with the world is friendship with the prince of this world. So to fight the desires of the world is to do battle with the devil himself. Rather than resisting God's will for us, we should resist the devil. James seems to suggest that our unfaithfulness, our challenges of self-centeredness and worldliness is not only an internal problem, but it has an external challenge, the influence of the devil. I should not fight against, and we should not fight against one another or God, but rather our opposition is to be the devil. Our opposition is to be against the devil. Now, the word resist means to stand against. It means to oppose. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 6, and I'll just punctuate a few highlights out of this passage. I spent, when I was a pastor, several weeks unpacking spiritual warfare, spiritual victory. Ephesians 6 says you need to, explains kind of the final exhortation about how to walk in a manner worthy. And it ends with the recognition that you need to get strength. You don't have divine strength. You need to get dressed in the armor of God and you need to resist and stand against the influence of the enemy of God. And you need to be constantly praying so that you have help and leadership from God. That's a quick summary of these verses. Let's read them and I'll highlight some things and then we'll call it a day as we begin the year in an effort to enjoy greater grace. Finally, meaning at the end of the letter, the bottom line, the end. Finally, be strong. It's a present passive verb. Do this, do it now. Do it daily, present tense, now and every day, and it's passive, which means you receive strength. So if you're going to be strong, you receive strength. You don't conjure it or create it. You receive strength, 
which comes from the Lord, and it consists of the strength of his might. How much might is that? Resurrection might, create the world might, do everything and anything I want to might, that kind of might. Receive strength, which comes from the Lord, in the sphere of the Lord, which consists of the strength of his might. Number one, you've got to receive divine strength. There is a daily dependence upon God for help necessary in order to live the life that is able to stand and resist the enemy of God. It's a military term. It means to offer resistance. You don't give an inch. You don't retreat. There's no, re no defeat. You work to stand against and opposed to the enemy. The key idea is this is beforehand action. The passage is going to unfold and say you need to get strength and then you need to put on the whole armor of God so that you can stand against the enemy and you get that strength from God through by trusting in the promises of God. Abraham grew strong through faith being confident that what God had promised he was able also to perform. Spiritual strength, supernatural power is the product of believing God's promises and living life in hope because he said what he said. Because he can do what he says he can do. I don't care if Sarah's too old to have children. I don't care if I'm too old to have children. He contemplated Sarah's womb. He didn't stagger in unbelief, but grew strong through faith. Be strong is receiving God's power as you believe God's promises. Harry, I'll take care of you. Harry, I'll, I'll satisfy you. Even when I don't have it, I trust God will provide it, and the strength he gives is in order for me to be victorious in it. Strength, receive it. Verse 10, be strong, receive strength, which consists of the Lord's power. Next verb, put on the full armor of God. All of it, not some of it. Put on the full armor of God. Why? So that you may stand firm against what? The schemes of the devil. His wiles, his temptations. Verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Your problem isn't your friends. It isn't your family. It isn't the government. It's not someone in your life physical. Your struggle, your wrestling is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. My problem is not people. My problem is the enemy who influences people. And the way I stand against that is in the armor of God. Not armor made in Harry's garage over an oak orchard. The armor that is divine, supernatural armor that'll protect me from a supernatural enemy who's wicked. The word devil means throw down, diabolos, someone who throws down. He gets thrown down and his goal is to throw you down. Satan, 52 times in the Bible, the adversary of God, the adversary of the people of God. He's your enemy, spiritual wickedness in high places, fallen angel, cast out of heaven, thrown down because he wanted to be God, usurped the place of God. God cast him out of heaven. One third of heaven's host followed him. One third of supernatural, supernatural angelic entities, angels, fell with him. Some were condemned to the bottomless pit awaiting the ultimate judgment, but they are organized like a military group designed to do destruction to the glory of God and the people of God. You have an enemy, and he's heartless, and he's ruthless. That's why Revelation 9 says his name is Apollyon, destroyer. Abaddon, one who damages. They come out of the pit, and they damage people to the point where people want to die, and they can't. Unleashed, Satan would destroy you. He hates you, but he's a seducing enemy. Put on the armor of God, stand in the strength of God so you can resist the enemy of God and the people of God. And he highlights what these armor elements are. Verse 14, stand firm. He reemphasizes this resistance. Therefore, having girded your loins with truth, that means to acquire the truth, prepare by learning the words of God. It's the belt. 
having put on the breastplate of righteousness, that's applying the truth. You don't get righteous. You apply the truth of righteousness because you've received it. You accept it. You have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You have war shoes. They are spiked with the convictions that I'm accepted. God's my friend, not my enemy. I don't have to be afraid. I don't care how intimidating the enemy is. I will succeed. And I'm standing in that confidence. I'm not backing up. All the armor was on the front. There wasn't protective elements on the back. If you, turn and run, if you would turn and run, you were vulnerable. The armor of God, the truth that you acquire, the truth that you apply, the truth that you accept, that I'm reconciled with God, I'm locked down, my feet are solid, because it's the gospel of what? Peace. God's my friend. He's with me. I don't have to be afraid of whoever or whatever is against me. Verse 16, in addition to all, these are preparations. In addition to all those preparations, take up the shield of faith. It was the size of a door, it would cover from head to foot. It was movable. It was the shield of faith. Trust in the truth you know. Apply it as the darts are shot at you. And it's able, verse 16, to extinguish all the fiery darts of the evil one. These, these were darts that were inflamed. They would incinerate. One warrior in history had 200 darts on his shield. The enemy shoots fiery, seducing darts of temptation. Kind of think Jesus in the wilderness. Hey, you're awfully hungry. You, you're the son of God. You can turn these rocks into bread. That's a true statement. But man doesn't live by bread alone. So he took the faith in God the Father to provide what was needed in order to combat the seduction of the enemy. Take the helmet of salvation. What it is, what is that? The confidence of counting on the fact that the salvation you enjoy, your relationship with God, your security of heaven, we talked about assurance, it protects my mind from doubt. It guards me from uncertainty. I know I'm saved. I know it's God's work, and I put that helmet on, and I wield, here it is, verse 17, finally, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's, a, it's not a broad sword. It's called the Machaira. It's 18 inches long. It's a dagger that sticks. It's a, you could surgically injure someone. It was very precise. You take the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, and you rehearse it out loud in the face of temptation. You resist the devil in order to be faithful in the day of temptation. Verse 13, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. What day is the evil day? Well, you could argue, argue every day is evil. But I want to suggest to you that every day it's not an attack of the enemy, but there are days, times, and spaces where there's an intensity of the enemy's attack. And on those days, verse 13, stand firm, having done everything, stand firm. Don't back up, don't give in, don't capitulate. Stand in the power of God. Stand in the truth of God. Verbalize the word of God. The enemy cannot read your mind. He doesn't know what you're thinking. But when you speak the words of truth with power and faith, you resist the enemy with those words standing in truth. And what does the Bible say? What does James say? He will flee from you. Humble people stand in the truth, empowered by the God of truth, and they renounce the lie and they rehearse the truth and they enjoy the victory that God gives through greater grace. I don't have to be worldly, and I don't have to be self-centered. I have to be humble. And in my humility, I bow and I resist. And I enjoy victory from God. Very early on, and I'll close with this, in my marriage, 
married in less than a year, living in a mobile home park while I went to seminary and worked full time at the local sporting goods store. And Karen and I were jogging through the uh, mobile home park. Just got married. Married a girl, beautiful, can't believe this happened. She's with me, that kind of a situation. And we're jogging along and out of the corner of my eye, peripherally, I see this movement this big movement, I turned and coming at me full force was a Doberman Pinscher, 90 pounds plus, I mean a big dog, and he was dragging his chain. It was intimidating. So in an effort to be husband of the year, <laughs> as that Doberman is coming full force, I turned in that position of strength and confidence. No. You know what he did? He sat. Uh, I felt good. <laughs> you don't have to be eaten. And I'm thankful he responded to me. I'll tell you who will respond to you in the power of the Holy Spirit, the enemy that's bigger than that Doberman. No, I'm not doing that. Yes, I am doing this. He will flee from you. He sat and he drug his chain home. That's the picture I want to have in your mind as you begin this new year. Some of you are caught in cycles of endless self-centeredness and you're a friend of the world and an enemy of God and you don't have to be and you shouldn't be because God has capacity. Can you say amen to that? Father, thank you for the opportunity to open your word today. So much to say out of this section of Scripture. And it's my prayer that these young people will have the greatest year they've ever had. They'll overcome things they've been unable to achieve help and victory in. And I pray that they would be successful as they humble themselves, submitting and resisting. And I ask this for us all, for the glory of God and the blessing of those who will hear the truth that we profess. That's my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.